Tanzanian soldiers killed in the Democratic Republic of Congo following a missile attack in the eastern region. Bus full of passengers swept away by raging waters in Kenya, 41 passengers rescued, plus New reports in Mali reveal over 100 people died as a result of extreme heat waves. Hello and welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olaride. A mortar attack in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo has killed three Tanzanian soldiers. According to the Southern African Development Community, SADC, hostile missile fire fell near the camp in the attack where three others got injured. None of the soldiers has been named nor have further details been given on where or when the attack took place. Last year, the Congolese government invited the Southern African Regional Force, and that's comprising of 2,900 soldiers, to halt worsening insecurity linked to numerous rebel groups vying for control of the eastern DRC's rich mineral resources. Now, emergency services have been rescuing passengers who were trapped in a bus that was swept away by floods on a busy highway in northern Kenya. Police say the bus with about 50 passengers was heading to the capital, Nairobi, from northern Warji County. The driver had attempted to cross a flooded section of the road when it happened. Uh, the bus then became stuck in some mud surrounding, uh, surrounded by raging waters. Some of the passengers were rescued from the roof of the vehicle. The Kenya Red Cross says it was a challenging rescue operation uh, to save the lives of those who were marooned by raging waters in the larger Areli area, and that's near Tula Village in Tana River County. The incident happened in the early hours of Tuesday after ongoing rains that left the Garissa-Nairobi Highway heavily flooded. Joining us now is Cyrus Ambati, Kenyan journalist, for more details in Nairobi. Hello, Cyrus. Thank you so much for your time. What is the update uh, at this present moment? Have all passengers been rescued? Thank you for having me in the show. Uh, we understand that uh, all passengers have been rescued since uh, the operation started last night. The Kenya Red Cross, the military, and the military joined the operation, and they managed to rescue actually all, all the passengers who are trapped above, uh, above on the top of the vehicle because they have stayed there for almost eight hours. It was flooded. The area was flooded in a way because uh, uh, the heavy rains are being experienced in Kenya currently. Now, looking at the circumstances surrounding the bus, you know, water everywhere and was stuck in mud, this could have easily gone, you know, another way. But thankfully, uh, the passengers, like you said, have all been rescued. But how are Kenyans uh, reacting to this? Well, Kenyans are now blaming the driver because he didn't hear the, the warnings from other drivers who are from the area and the passengers themselves because... Uh, he arrived at the site and then he decided to drive through the water because he narrated the, the currents or the rather the, the, the post of the water. So everyone is blaming the driver because uh, he didn't hear what he didn't hear the warning that he was given by the other drivers and the passengers who were on board in this vehicle. But then uh, police are saying that uh, they are going to take action on, on the driver who also survived the, the incident. And now, you know, the Red Cross said it was a challenging operation to rescue the, those people. And uh, during this time of heavy rains, what measures are the government now taking in averting another uh, such of incident? Well, currently the government is issuing warnings all over the country because the, the, the heavy rains that are being experienced from now until June, uh, like now the same road that where it happened actually, They are part of the country is going to be affected one or the other. Uh, the Kenya National Highway Authority, which is responsible for all those roads on the uh, where the, these bars are passing, they are using uh, choppers to go around and check on the the with the veracity of the rains or the water which are raging around. So they are issuing warnings and stopping people from moving from one place to the other. Uh, that's the much they can do as of now because uh, they're just issuing all warnings and telling people uh, 
probably living on the lower areas of uh, where the, this river is flowing to, especially they are flowing to the, the Indian Ocean to move away to the upper end, the, uh, kind of uh, hilly or high, high end areas. So far, it's much, there's nothing much. Many people have been displaced in those areas. And uh, the, the only that they are getting from the government is food and uh, other amenities for their survival. That's we wait for the water to kind of uh, reduce. All right, then, Cyrus Mbati, Kenyan journalist in Nairobi, thank you for your reporting. Thank you, Kai. Thank you for having this show. We're in Togo now, where the lawmakers have launched consultations across the West African country. The move comes after a controversial constitutional reform was passed in late March by lawmakers whose legitimacy has been challenged. Togolese lawmakers will conduct a three-day tour to, what, uh, to listen and to inform civilians on the constitutional reform. Customary rulers and selected groups are reported to be the main target of the consultations. The proposed constitution, which was passed in March, grants parliament the power to choose the president, uh, doing away with direct elections. Now, this transitions Togo from a presidential to a parliamentary system of government. Instead of a renewable five-year term, the proposed bill restricts the power of future presidents and introduces a one-term limit. Well, opposition uh, supporters and leaders fear the role could become an avenue for the president to extend his grip on power. Reports by meteorologists in Mali say more than 100 people have died because of an extreme heat wave that hit the country last month. Well, last week, the southwestern town of Kayes recorded a temperature high of 48.5 degrees Celsius. It will be the hottest day in African history recorded in April, and that's according to weather officials. Local media reports that Gabriel Toure Hospital in the capital, Bamako, received 102 heat-affected patients who died upon arrival, where most of them were over 60 years of age and chronically ill. Officials have urged residents to stay in well-ventilated areas and restricted learning for school children as the young and elderly are the most vulnerable. Authorities have also shortened and uh, changed the school hours for primary school students to protect them from the fatal temperatures. The final day of the Women Lift Health Conference ended with workshops designed to equip women health practitioners for leadership and also a charge on them to transform knowledge and experience gained into results. Our correspondent Bukola Koka reports from Tanzania. So in this particular approach of the conflict dynamics profile, what would the advocacy for more women in public health leadership be without the women soliciting the support of the men, especially in a challenging world? Can change at any time. Therefore, this important subject matter formed the opening theme for the first panel on the last day of the conference, covering other themes like navigating workplace politics and gender bias in the workplace the potential women leaders in this nucleus are being equipped to recognize and manage the challenges along the pathways to attaining the leadership positions required to achieve the desired results in public health. It is a society's shared beliefs, so it belongs to the society. So how many societies did you say? Are in? About 500, okay, so 500 different societies, it could be 500 different shared beliefs. When we talk about shared beliefs, we use the word norms. You see that there's the root of the word normative. It means that it's shared, shared beliefs, norms, okay? Largely, I would say gender is also about who we are, roles, identities, where we come from, and very deeply linked with this, the whole notion of power as well. So in this particular approach of the conflict dynamics profile, this focuses on specific behavioral responses to conflict and how some of these behaviors might be changed. And it starts with the assumption that whether we like it or not, conflict is inevitable. It happens all the time, every day. We're dealing with conflict all the time. Leadership is a lifetime journey. It's a privilege and should be intentional. And as Anita Zaidi emphasized, gender 
cannot be a side issue. We need to have collective action to change the narrative and reimagine leadership. It looks like it's a women role, but the talk that we had in the morning about men being allies and having them on board is helpful because it changed the conversation. But we don't just see men as like the enemies, understanding they also have a part to, to uh, a role to play and also involving them. Some Nigerian women commissioners and the special advisor to President Bola Tinubu on Health share their gleanings from the conference. We have uh, so many policies for the health sector and uh, one of my mandate is implementing this policy. And I want to assure you that using all the experiences that have been here, I will ensure that these policies are implemented. And to ensure that, because I know that implementing these policies will change the narrative. It's very, very important to me. I can say this is one of the most significant activities that take place during my office, because I am increased in knowledge We've increased in capacity, and we have made so many interactions that will contribute massively to the running of my ministry. So I enjoy it very well. So it's important because it also gives us opportunity to learn how to step up our skills in leadership in the country and how we can play a better role guiding policy to nature and also the founder of the Women in Leadership Advancement Network, Willen, speaks on the prospects of Nigerian women commissioners participating in the conference. For, for a lot of the female commissioners um, and even the special advisor to the president who have come to this conference, there were immense opportunities for networking. We had over 800 delegates attend this conference, so immense opportunities to learn and to share best practices, an opportunity as well to see what donors are interested in and where the trends are evolving to. The Women Lift Health Global Conference closes today having convened funders, implementers, healthcare givers, and public health practitioners in a vibrant ecosystem. But what's more important is the results that should be discernible in the human health indicators of the countries represented here such that this three-day exercise would not have been just another talk shop. From Dar es Salaam in Tanzania, Bukola Koka for Channels Television News. Still to come on the program. Charity group Doctors Without Borders calls on the United Nations to expedite humanitarian aid to Sudan. Please stay with us. Welcome back to the program. The medical charity Medicine Sans Frontiers, also known as Doctors Without Borders, has made an urgent appeal for humanitarian agencies that have suspended work in Sudan to return to the country. This is nearly a year after fighting began between rival military factions. MSF says a colossal humanitarian crisis is taking place. It's calling on the United Nations to use its influence and leadership to ensure a rapid increase in aid. Nearly 5 million people in Sudan face emergency levels of hunger. The Norwegian Refugee Council recently warned of grave danger of an imminent famine. And as the war rages on in Sudan, patients in hospitals are battling for treatment because health facilities are reporting problems with both capacity and the availability of procedures during the ongoing conflict. The conflict, which began in April 2023, has caused severe disruption to medical treatment, as well as ongoing issues with trade routes and domestic operations. At the East Oncology Center in al Qadarif, officials say the facility is suffering from overcrowding following the outbreak of the war. Although cancer patients are undergoing treatment in the hospital, Many report issues with both capacity and availability of procedures during the ongoing conflict. After the outbreak of war in Khartoum, the center began to suffer from overcrowding of patients and increased frequency of admissions. Before the war, 
we received 30 to 35 patients a month. After the war, the number doubled. And after the beginning of the civil war, it increased many times over. Dr. Kisemba adds that the number of days dedicated to chemotherapy had been increased from two to five a week, as well as a small staff pool working additional shifts. Ishan Mohammed Suleiman, displaced patient from Darfur, said her treatment had been interrupted many times by the fighting. I started chemotherapy in Khartoum. After three doses, the war broke out. Then I was displaced to Shendi and completed my treatment there. I had a second operation. After two months, I felt pain again. So I went to Madani. After suffering for eight days on the road, I underwent tests and began treatment. Over in Omdurum, a sister city of the capital Khartoum, the sole health care facility, the Al Rumi Medical Center, finally reopened after being closed in April 2023 amidst fighting between the Sudan Armed Forces and militants of the Rapid Support Forces. May God fix the country and end this war. The center includes all medical specialties in the field of treatment and an external pharmacy. And with God's help, and success, we treat all patients. Footage shows the inside of the center where citizens line up at the reception desks, waiting to get their medical checkups in the main hall, while doctors carry out their work in the laboratory and conduct examinations for their patients. Our Rumi Medical Center provides integrated medical services in all specialties and rare specialties. We have a heart consultant, a kidney consultant, an ophthalmology department, and a dental department. We used to work in the morning shift, but now we work in the evening shift as well. Fighting continues between Sudan's armed forces and militants of the Rapid Support Forces. Up to 15,000 people have been killed, according to UN sources, with over 8 million displaced. Back here in Nigeria, barely three weeks after some parts of the popular Dosumu market in Lagos Island were gutted by fire, Another part of the market has been gutted by fire this morning. A two-story building was affected in Tuesday's fire incident, although no casualty has been recorded. Safety agencies, including the Lagos State Fire Service and the National Emergency Management Authority, are on ground trying to put out the fire and stop any further casualties. The cause of the fire is yet to be determined. Well, fire incidents are a regular occurrence in the markets in Lagos Island due to the proximity of the buildings. On Monday, a building housing various hair wigs vendors was gutted by fire in the Akmomo area. The fire was later put out without any casualty. Also in January, a warehouse in Mandela's building on Broad Street was also gutted by fire, destroying goods worth millions of naira. A British man successfully runs the full length of Africa, crossing the finish line in Tunisia after 352 days. Now, before he set off on the mammoth challenge to run the entire length of Africa, Russell Cook, who's nicknamed Hardest Giza, said he hoped to look back at his life and have no regrets. Well, after running through 16 countries, the 27-year-old has raised in excess of 700,000 pounds for his Project Africa Race charity. He arrived in Tunisia on Sunday, finishing the epic journey to cheers and shouts from the assembled crowd of well-wishers. We came and want to support uh, Ross's amazing uh, uh, achievement of running the first man ever to run the length of Africa and just be supportive, to be honest. Like, you know, next generation, like, the amount of inspiration he's given to everyone here and ongoing, I think it's going to be super cool to see, the, you know, what more is going to happen. We come regularly to Tunisia. We love Tunisia too much. Um, 
but we knew that he was finishing here in this country, so we were very excited. Mm -hmm. Because in England, we live in the same town, and Tunisia is very important for us as well, so we had to see him celebrate. Now, against all odds, an Ethiopian artist who lost both hands as a child is finding the inspiration to follow his passion of painting. At 90 years of age, Waku Mamo says he is pursuing his dream of becoming a painter after finishing art school. We'll have the reports later on. In the meantime, cultural and religious norms have been identified as the root cause of sexual and gender-based violence. This is the position of participants at an event on sexual and gender-based violence which took place in Abuja. The consensus here is that the prevention must be taken seriously to address the menace of sexual and gender-based violence. Acts of violence in Nigeria occur across cultures, social class and ethnic groups. Like in many parts of the world, gender-based violence remains a pervasive issue that undermines the rights and dignity of women and girls. Data reveals that an estimated 736 million women have been subjected to physical or sexual violence globally. In Nigeria, 33% of women have experienced physical violence at the age of 15. Similarly, data from the Mirabel Center in Lagos shows that 81% of reported cases of sexual assault between 2013 and 2019 were committed against children. Unfortunately, these staggering statistics have been worsened by security challenges, particularly in the northern part of the country. Amidst these challenges, this roundtable discussion provides a platform for collaboration and the need to explore diverse approaches to gender-based violence prevention. Amidst these challenges, there is hope. Hope in the transformative power of collaboration, innovation and solidarity. Traditional and religious leaders are key in discussions here, as they are believed to have the capacity to implement community-led initiatives towards challenging negative practices against women and girls. We create culture, we create uh, traditions, and as we change, these cultures and traditions are to change too. Male chauvinists and others who want to put women and girls down they would look for scriptural passages to hinge their behavior on. But we are able to, at these training workshops that we have, we are able to debunk those things. Despite the challenges, an assessment of successes recorded in the fight against SGBV were also highlighted with a focus on prevention. Uh, over the past four years, we ran a maternity waiting room in Sokoto, one of the states with the highest maternal mortality, and through that project, uh, we've seen over 5,000 women pass through it without a single incidence of mortality. I will recognize the importance of the traditional institutions and religious institutions. Education remains very paramount. We must change the orientation of it. The expected outcome from this roundtable is to improve the capacity and collaboration with traditional and religious leaders to address negative norms through regular community dialogue. Victoria Longjun for Channels Television News. Let's now take you to that report of the Ethiopian 90-year-old man who is following his passion of painting. Warku Mamo, a 90-year-old Ethiopian artist, has defied the odds to pursue his passion for painting despite facing a significant challenge. He lost both hands in a bomb blast when he was just 10 years old. In Addis Ababa, the artist is sketching with remarkable skill, using his arm storms to guide the pencil across the canvas as students washed on. Colorful paintings and detailed sketches could be seen in his studio. Despite losing his hands, he says he was determined to pursue his dream of becoming a painter after finishing art school, he travels to Russia, where he said he had learned how to live. From Russian people, I learned how to live, and I did not only learn painting, 
from Russian people, but also help people live together. Not seeing people as political and understanding that all Russian people have freedom of thought. Studying at the Repin Institute of Arts in St. Petersburg from 1962 to 1972, he was exposed to a new culture that left a lasting impression on him. If you go about it in peace and diplomatic ways, you live with them for a long time. But if your way of thinking is bad, you will miss many things. He also highlighted the importance of not viewing people through a political lens and recognizing the freedom of thought that all Russians possess. And that's where we end the program today. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Layo Olarindi.